Hey, what do you got going on? I don't care. I don't care because I know that Jack Prince can promote everything and anything. You need a flyer? Don't worry about it. We're cheaper than a copy shop. $5,000 for $99? How's that sound at 4 by 6 You need postcards? Don't worry about it. I'll get you a thousand of those as low as $124, four by six. And you think, oh, those are great for small items, but I need something bigger, Bricky. I need a poster. All right. How's 11 by 17, 250 posters for $150 sound? Put that in your promotional pipe and smoke it. Jack Prince can promote everything and anything. We got you covered. JackPrince.com. Bring your promotion to us. We'll show you. We can promote everything. Visit JackPrince.com slash Circle of Trust to save even more. You're listening to the AID Network. Coming to you live from the Saul Rosenberg Studios... Broadcasting worldwide into all ships at sea, here comes another action-packed episode of Adventure in Design. Dan Styles, welcome back to Adventures in Design. Oh, always a pleasure. Thanks for coming up and visiting me this time. Good to see you face-to-face. This is your first home game. Uh, true, true. First home game. First one in your own this territory. Is, this isn't my house, actually. <laughs> oh, just I, I borrowed this from a friend just to impress you. Well, I, I, <laughs> your friend's living a pretty impressive lifestyle. You know, Dan, I always joke on the show, but every joke has a little bit of seriousness to it. Nobody gets rich at the game of design, you know? I've interviewed some of the biggest names, seen where they work, seen where they live, I've come to realize no one gets rich from design, but you, my friend, you're wealthy, which is different. You've got a wealthy lifestyle here. You got the wife, you got the daughters, beautiful home. Everybody has their own space. Wife has the basement. You have the the attic level, third floor, I guess is what it would third be called. Third floor, yeah. Yeah. Attic's a little more realistic. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a peaked ceiling, so you could call it an attic. Well, you're a big guy and you're not hunched over, so that goes to show we're, what we're working with. But this is a wealthy lifestyle, man. I mean, Portland, world-class city. You're in a great neighborhood. You're close to fine dining and restaurants and to give your kids culture, like... This is a wealthy lifestyle. Well, I, I think the thing is, and I never really set out to be just, you know, like bling bling wealthy, right? Right. I mean, I like to have money. I don't like to be poor. Uh, but it's all about, I mean, your life happens to you every day, right? And right. so if you spend your whole day like toiling in some office or, or doing something you don't want to do to make a ton of money, you know, that, the reason I, I work for myself, the reason I do the type of work I do, the reason I live where I live and how I live is that, you know, your day-to-day existence is your life, right. right? So, you know, I used to have a job and I'd go in and it was okay, but you realize that you're spending 40, 50, 60 hours a week sort of doing for others. Yeah. And then those, and then you, you try to like have a little bit of fun on the weekends, right? But yeah. you know, I've, it, I've really tried to weave my entire life into a, into a lifestyle that I always enjoy. Well, I think that that leads me to my, my big thought is if none of us are going to get rich doing what we're doing, then we should at least be wealthy, right? Like sure. if, if you're not going to just crush it and, and be able to like, well, I work hard, but those three weeks at my summer home in Hawaii really make it all worthwhile. Like there's something to be said for the wealth and the day-to-day experience that you don't have the shit commute and you don't have to go someplace and deal with bad jokes from middle management just to suffer through. And you're like, as soon as these two girls are done with college, right, I'm going to go do something I really like with my life. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and one of the things that bums me out, but also makes me happy because it bums me out for them. It makes me happy for AID that we're able to provide the service, but some of the hardest of hardcore AID listeners in the circle of trust, mm-hmm. they started a Slack channel uh, and I mean, they started it and just invited me to it, which I thought was cool because if they didn't invite me, then they could probably feel a lot more free to talk shit about the show. Uh, but, and I try not to go too deep in the channel so that they have room to talk about things and not feel like, you know, the boss is, is this the like the Mark Bricky fan club? Is that, is it's that what this far, is? It, they're far from a fan club. <laughs> <laughs> they have a, one of the kids or, or you know, I say that about anybody, I, anybody's a kid in my mind. I think of me as a kid, but one of the kids, I believe his screen name is like Jay Sean or Jay Shun or something like that. Uh, 
he has an ongoing list of things. He has a list of offensive things that I've said, and it's the reasons why I'll never be a part of like the Adobe family or, uh, or, you know, he's basically like has a list of things. I forgot what his catchy name is, but it's like reasons why Mark Bricky will never be accepted in the design community. <laughs> and it's always these like <laughs> wild analogies that I'll bring out of my mind, you know, just like, you know, the most fucked up, like it's just meant to be like a little light drop on the show. But then when he types them out, I'm like, uh, he's, he's making a strong case against me. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's your niche. Your, your niche is that you are outside of the establishment. Exactly. And he celebrates that keeps the list together. But the point of that is, is that in that community, they have a channel called full time for insurance. And that, that has always just been a theme on the show that has just bummed me out when I meet really talented people that have to go do something that they hate just to get insurance, medical care for them and their kids. Yeah, yes and no. I mean, it's funny. I did my Adobe Max presentation this year, and, and the first year was all about, like, here's some work I did, and here's how I did the work. And and it was it was sort of Dan Styles' greatest hits. And then, yeah. and then I, I backed off each one. I said, well, all right, so you've seen the final product, which is what everybody does when they do a presentation. It's like, here's my greatest stuff I've ever done in my life. Um, but what I tried to do was like, okay, here's how I arrived at this. Here's the process. Here's yeah. the failures. Here's all the stuff along the way that nobody ever shows you. Outside they, the artboard. Right, because they want you to think they're a genius. Yeah. And it's not genius. It's just hard work, a little bit of luck. You yeah. Know? Um, so this year I came back, I'm like, well, I already kind of, I blew that wad, right? I, I got no more greatest hits. So I was like, well, all right, I'm going to talk about setting yourself up as an independent designer. Mm. You know, how do you go from being somebody who works for somebody else to working on your own, to having right. clients you like, right. to having a schedule that you can that won't kill you and, and all those things. And I feel like it was it was a little bit more of a boring presentation because it was a little more real life. Yeah. Um, but one of the things I really covered in that was this insurance part. Uh, and I don't think that you necessarily need to have a job for insurance. I I truly I, you always should have insurance. Um, as we know from last year, you know, we would have been bankrupt if we would have had to pay for Mel's cancer out of pocket. Right. Uh, but you know, as a single, if you're like a single guy who's 33 years old, starting his own thing, you can get insurance for like $400 a month. Right. If you can't afford that, you shouldn't be working for yourself anyway. You know what true, I mean? True. Uh, so, I mean, there's overhead that comes with, with working for yourself right. that will be significantly higher than what you had working for somebody else. Right. But you can also, you can charge more, you know, like... You can also not pay as much in taxes. Right. I mean, you can save, I mean, this whole, because you're sitting in my house right now, what to say that? Um, well, we were going to pretend like we're at shit, flat stock. I blew that. We, I blew that right out of the gate. Right. Um, you know, but this space we're in right now, this is a, this is a legitimate tax write-off. I'm not cheating when I write off this portion of my home because this is my office. You have a so, home that has four levels to it. Right. And two of them are office space. Right. Uh, so I don't know. I, I I feel like if you really want to get out there and, and work on your own, you know, don't let insurance be the thing that stops you from doing it. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that for a lot of people, the insurance, it, it it's really a, a deep metaphor for all things scary, right? Because mm -hmm. we have insurance as go to sleep at night because you know that if something goes wrong with my precious Beth or your Mel, that we've got it covered. And in your situation, if you wake up tomorrow and there's a huge lump in your throat, you know that those two little girls are going to get a pile of money if you go six feet below, right? right? That's what insurance is. But I think the full time for insurance is they're thinking that it's about medical care, but they're really looking at insurance as the job is just mom and dad well the job is security it's you're, security. you're sucking from that golden teat you exactly know? Like, and so it's 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 the whole it's like it it it's a great excuse to not have to gamble the security is false it is how many people do you know who have been laid off from their design job like for instance uh, i know an awful lot of architects because my my wife is a former architect and when the last downturn happened they all lost their jobs. Right. Every single one of them right. lost their jobs because architecture is tied to construction. Right. Construction went down the shitter. And the first thing, I mean, architecture firm is just a big room full of people sitting at computers, right? right. The only expense they have are their people. So they, they just start slashing people right and left until eventually the firm is like the boss. Right. And that's the only person left. 
And then, you know, as the economy picks back up, people get hired back on. But there is no job security in working for somebody else. Nobody's do, do you really think at your job, for instance, that your boss is going to be like, oh, times are getting tight. I'm going to take a pay cut so that I can keep John over there at his at his at his seat. No, there'll you be know? a couple of bosses here and there that will do that. But at the end of the day. Nobody's going to take money away from their family to give it to yours. Right. You are in a business relationship right. with your boss, right. just like if you were an independent contractor. Right. It, it, but that's the thing. That is the scary fact about life that all of us know that are the the 1099 nomads, right? Is that there's no security anywhere. Like yeah. it, Any one of your clients can fire you. Tomorrow, I could say something that's wildly, insanely uh, offensive, and all of my subscribers could cancel their subscriptions, and then my positive cash flow goes down to no cash flow. And I realized that. I mean, it, it was literally like one wacky thing in the world events could happen. The money could go right back to 2009. Everything could come to a screeching halt, and we're all fucked. Yep. I mean, we're just, we're all rolling around. Like the economy basically is a bounce house, right? They say it's a bubble. It's a bounce house. It's like dudes show up. They pump a lot of air into it. Everybody takes off their shoes. And they're bouncing around and they're having fun. But at some time, that rental agreement is over. Right. Those guys turn off those whistle-shaped blowers. <laughs> the thing deflates. You put on your shoes and you fucking go home. That's the economy. That is a, that is the best metaphor for an econo economic situation I've ever heard in my life. You're, you're brilliant. You should write a book. Uh, I'm, I'm the bounce house economy. <laughs> I've actually uh, I've been thinking about doing a book, and it was originally proposed to me that you know to to grow the podcast you have to have a book. And I told my agent, I'm like, I don't write. And he goes, Yeah, I know that dummy. You ever heard of ghost? writers mm -hmm. and i said well i don't believe in ghosts and i don't believe in ghost writers like what am i going to do just talk to a spirit well, through you, a candle you, you talk i mean that's what i'm starting well, to realize you, you and i did the the center part of my book together yeah uh, and that was just an interview that i literally sent into some some website right and they transcribed it and sent it back in words on paper <laughs> right and then i went and edited out all the ums and you know yeah. all the weird little bits because they literally transcribe everything yeah uh and then you, you you know you're like oh this looks like written word now yeah. you know and then I, I just published that i'm like here's just put you know, it in the middle of your yeah, book the, that's the part that nobody reads you know yeah the words in the art book one thing leads to another still available no they're all sold out uh but they are not going to do a second edition so i guess i got to write another book wow or to learn how to sell that pdf something I don't, yeah i need to i need to work out what to do about that if I, you go I, over to dan uh, com slash store you can buy the ai file of the book and make <laughs> your own version <laughs> the indesign file is printed out <laughs> So you're headed off to flat stock, mm -hmm. and now we're in your flat stock booth. Boom, oh, here we look are. at your beautiful ten by twenty booth here at the Austin Convention Center. Hey, Mort, what's up, Fred? An end cap this year. Ooh, the end cap. So flat stock, it's one of those annual traditions, uh, and I think that the 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 best thing about getting involved in live vending, the absolute best part of it, is that you have a date on your calendar that forces you to get shit done. It, it, it gives, for once in your life, it gives self-initiated work a that's deadline. That's very true. Very a true. deadline. That's, I think that's the value of it. It really is because I know that when we were back in Portland, seconds ago, you were telling me and showing me all of the stuff that you got ready for flat stock this year. So this year you made a, an actual effort to be stocked up and ready yeah to roll. so this actually stems from the conversation we had around christmas time your your end of year show you had yeah. a name for it but it was uh 20 creators for 18 minutes yeah that one uh the 2018 show yeah um and you asked me one of the questions was and i don't even know if it made the final cut was sort of like what are you going to be doing differently in 2018? everything everything makes the everything cut. made the cut uh and I, I instinctively said more because that's always been my answer. For 25 years, it's just been like next year I'm going to work even harder. I'm going to get more clients. I'm going to make more money. I'm going to do, you know, just more, more, more. Uh, and then I realized shortly thereafter, uh, as I was kind of running through this more concept, I'm like, oh, I'm going to start this new line of prints. It's going to be completely different from what I've been doing. Uh, and, you know, it's essentially a third company I'm going to run. And I'm, right. I'm bouncing this idea off Mel. And she's like, well, you know, why, why would you do that? And I'm like, you're right. And I, I got to thinking, what I really need to do is do what I'm already doing and just do it better. Right. And so South by Southwest is the first, you know, I've cut the year into basically four parts. And nice. it's the end of the first quarter. And it's this test of can I simply take the things I'm already doing and do them better? 
Uh, so, for instance, instead of throwing all my shit in a box like three days before mm-hmm. South by, mm-hmm. I started working in January in a very organized fashion to go through and reorder stuff that was out of stock, design new product. Um, you know, pull everything together in an, an organized fashion. I've already got, you know, like five or six boxes packed yeah. of things that I've, you know, that I've already developed, that I've worked out the, the, the various things that you need to have. I'm not, I'm not saying this right. I'm essentially going in in an organized fashion as opposed to with my head up my ass like I normally do. Well, you normally, if, if my memory serves me correctly, January normally starts out slow and then around February, when you should be getting ready for March, is when your client work comes sure. in. So normally by the time South By rolls around, four or five days before, you just throw what you see in boxes. Exactly. And and tape up stuff that, or, or just take boxes that you literally closed in December after holiday sales and just go to Texas with it. And then I see you putting together a booth with whatever you brought. Yeah, that's exactly how it works. And, and you know, some years I may have the forethought to design a new T-shirt. Right. Uh, but usually, yeah, I mean, especially the last couple of years, it's, it's really been whatever I've had laying around. Uh, and this year is the first time I'm making a concerted effort to not do it that way. And, and flat stock is only the end of quarter one. But quarter two, I want to take these products that I've developed mm-hmm. for quarter one and I want to go, OK, what could be better about my website? Because I really am not updating it frequently enough. Uh, do I need a better online presence? Do I, you know, do I actually put some effort into an Etsy store? Yeah. Do I do I do all these other things to to now move this new product that right. I have? Right. Uh, and then you know, so there's a whole year long game plan that is based around you know developing and selling product that I have. Uh, and that's that's this year's plan is like, OK, so what can I do with with product? OK, next year, there's going to be a different plan. Maybe it's, you know, maybe do I need to step up my poster game or what do I need to do to attract more Fortune 500 clients? Um, but it's been amazing how well this has worked, mm-hmm. you know, really being conscientious about setting these goals and doing something towards them every single day. Like it's, it's the first thing on my calendar every yeah. morning. I got to do at least an hour towards this goal. Uh, and so it doesn't get pushed to the end of the day and then dropped, which is usually what happens. Like, oh, I mean, I've been meaning to get to that design, but oh, I'm, I'm working on this other stuff. Uh, so I'll get to that tomorrow. Yeah. Instead, it's the first thing I do every day. So it's the one thing that doesn't ever not get done. Uh, and just slowly trudging towards this goal. And it's it's working out splendidly. My first thing every day I do is accounting. Because I realized one day that if I ever wanted to do all of my dreams, they would all be based on money. And so I figured out the first thing I should do every day is just like, look. Are there any bills due? Do I owe any invoices? Um, do I did I take the money that just came in and did I break it up properly and put some in savings and some here and some there? Like that is the first thing I do every day is money, just because I realize it as much as I hate it, it's the most important part mm-hmm. of the whole fucking puzzle. Yep. And after that's done, then I'm like, okay, well now I've been an adult, not and go be a fucking kid and play on my podcast for the rest of the day. But I love this plan of yours. I'm gonna tell you what reality is gonna be though. Reality is this, as soon as you make a fucking hardcore plan for yourself, you're like, I got this year on lockdown. You, my friend, you're going to get hit with the biggest client job of your career this year. It could happen. That's the way life works. Yeah. Um, (laughs) But, but, you know, the nice thing about having this set up in that it's just an hour a day Mm -hmm. is that, and maybe at some point I do, I can't get that hour done, you know, but it's that slow step by step as opposed to being like, all right, so because usually it's like, well, January is usually slow. So I'm going to take all of January to redesign my website. Right. And then January is not slow. Yeah. And then the website never gets redesigned. Right. But even if you're doing a ton of client work, you can spare an hour a day to like butts with your website. You know, if you have a good plan, you're like, all right, week one, I'm going to go through and take out all the products that I'm sold out of. You know, week two, I'm going to go through and put in all the products that are new that I haven't put on there yet. Yeah. You know, week three, I'm going to clean up the blog or whatever. You know, you, you can. Anything can be cut, can be chunked, taken into small little bite-sized morsels and spread over a period of time. So you're just picking up one little bit a day. But see, this is how a winner thinks because a winner knows that self-initiated work only gets done if it gets treated like it's a client's job. And a client that calls you up and goes, hey man, I want you to do this thing for me, but zero rush. Like just whenever you can get it done, get it done. They're never going to see that job. Mm -hmm. The squeaky wheel is definitely the one that gets the grease. And that is just one of those kitschy sayings that is so fucking true. No, it's true. I mean, how many times have you had a $10,000 job with an easy client Mm -hmm. and then some jerk off didn't get their poster? uh, And so you stop what you're working on, the $10,000 job. For a $25 guy. $25 poster. Yeah. It happens all the time. And when you get sucked into that loop, you're like, 
you're rolling the poster going, I'm a fucking asshole. Like the Disney Corp is in the next room going, hey, if you can get this job done, we'll give you more work. Right. And I can't get that done because I'm busy, busy editing a conversation with Billy Ballman, <laughs> who's a waste of my space. So I totally agree with you that you have to have those priorities laid down. And the fact that you've plotted out the year, let's say that you do get hit with the biggest, you know, Amazon comes to you and says, hey, we're rolling out this new thing. We want you to be the guy that skins all the robots that we're putting all around the world, blah, blah, blah. Well, obviously, you got to take that. You're a family man. You can't be like, no, sorry, Amazon. I have a, a, a nine-month plan. I'm designing month. stickers. I'm busy. <laughs> but if you get through five of those weeks or five of months of that plan, at least the Dan Styles Corporation is further along. And I would argue that somewhere in there, you're creating the momentum that attracts. Well, that's Amazon. another really important thing, and and that's that's kind of an aside. But um, my entire business model is really that I create posters or my own little stupid T-shirts or whatever. That is what brings Amazon in. Yeah, like Amazon would not have come to me if my job was designing uh, user interfaces for business to business websites. They would never have knocked on my door. But they saw, oh, you know, you did that thing for the Arctic Monkeys tour last year. Like we, you know, our my manager loves the Arctic Monkeys and has that poster in his office and was like, we should get this guy to do this new project. And so it's that self-initiated work that is to blame for everything else. I was just talking to Lincoln Design Co. here in Portland. Mm -hmm. And and I said, you know, you guys do such a great job of always finding time for Lincoln. I mean, they, they put out so much client work. Like, how do you guys always have time to make new Lincoln logos for stickers and patches and T-shirts that, you know, if they sell a ton of those patches, there's no way it can make as much money as one job they get from Nike sure. or Hot Wheels. And uh, Dan, the owner, goes, well, it's real easy because whenever we see these decks that, like, Nike has put together of what the job is and what they want from Lincoln. There'll be a couple of things that we've done for Nike in there. And there'll be a couple of things for some of our other clients, but most of it is the stuff that we did for always, us. Always. I get those decks all the time and I, I get to see what is really resonating with people. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's always like, Oh man, we love this weird little t-shirt you did. Oh, we love this poster you did for this band. Um, we love these skateboard decks that you did for practically no money. Um, you know, it's never, right. it's, they never come back to go, Oh, remember that packaging job you did for Nabisco? Yeah. You know, like those Ritz crackers really knocked it out of the park here. Do the, <laughs> do the new sneaker, you know, release for, for, you know, Kobe, like that's not going to happen. One of my greatest hits back in the day when the show was largely, you know, focused to the poster community is, uh, you know, one of my tidbits of advice for a designer that is getting bullied by a band and their band's management is I would always tell them, hey, remember when you came to Hero to get a poster designed and you said that you like this poster that we did and, and that one for Spoon and that one for Wilco? And the agent would be like, yeah, I love those three. I'm like, well, you never said that you wanted this Mo poster. And the reason why you never said you wanted this Mo poster is because they bullied us into doing this. Right. And if we keep going down this road, you're not going to get a spoon poster. You're going to get a Mo poster. That happens all the time. Like you can go through my current, you know, whatever I got on my website right now and, and sort of pick out the losers. Yeah. And I can tell you why those were losers. Yeah. You know, and it's not because I didn't put in the work. It's right. because somebody else decided to pee in it. You a, know, a little, like little some, old fashioned cock blocking. Yeah. A little alpha male action going on there. So with the electric poster at South by Southwest this year, uh, it's probably already happened as this release date yes. goes out, but you did an electric poster show. Well, so I don't know if the audience is totally familiar with my electric poster thing that I've been doing, but they could go to at Dan styles on Instagram. You can and, see them on Instagram and dig through and you can see some yeah. of them and, and you can, different you can see them on stations. my, I have a couple blog postings about them too. Okay. Um, uh, I don't update my blog too often, but I do try to kind of put that sort of information in yeah. there, you know, videos about what they look like. But what I've been trying to do is essentially I asked myself, what more can be done with a poster? And and the first step beyond that was, well, I can animate them in After Effects. So I learned After Effects, learned to animate, which was a great thing to learn to do. The problem is I wound up with a digital product, you know, I, a little square animation. It, yeah. it was back to looking at your phone. Um and I wanted a physical poster. So I'm, I started thinking, well, what can I do with, with the physical poster? Uh, and that led me to 
looking at all the different types of like, for instance, conductive inks. You can walk up to a poster now and you can touch it and it can play music for, mm. or whatever. So I started building these highly experimental and I am not a software engineer. I am not an electrical engineer. I don't know jack shit about this stuff, but I, I really sat down and I said, well, what, what can I do? What can I assemble that's already out there? Cause they're, they're miniaturizing everything. Yeah. You know, they're just tons of little chips and lights and all this stuff uh, that's all coming out of computers and phones. Um, so can I take these little things and make them big again? Can I blow them up? Uh, so I've been making posters where, for instance, the eyeballs are little screens that move mm -hmm. or they have lights built in them or they have sound built in them or you touch them and they do something or you walk by. Like I did a poster for uh, the Predator. Um, and when you walk by, those three little lasers in mm -hmm. his helmet light up and like shoot lasers at you, you know, and stuff like that. Um, so anyway, I'm doing the, the I'm wrapping up the um, the last, the final show for Interactive at South by Southwest. Um, Media Temple has hired me to do all the promo for that and all the design. And as part of it, my my special addition to this is that I'm going to also be filling stubs with dozens of electric posters. Um, and this time it's it's um, it's a woman with she has records on her on her glasses and the records spin. There's lights oh, built wow. into the records that that spin yeah. around. I saw you messing around with some of that on your Instagram. I'm like, what the fuck is he up to over there? And I really, really love the idea of I've mastered this medium. What else can I do to it? And it'll be, it'll be insane to see where this goes. Like, are consumers willing to pay extra for an environmental interaction? I don't know. Uh, but I mean, it seems like it would open. I don't know where the demand for this consumer base is, but it's got to open doors with clients. That's the thing is, is when I started doing rock posters, I did not do them because I was going to make a lot of money. I of did course. them because I loved rock posters and I loved music. And so these are purely experimental. If it goes nowhere, fine. I've still had fun doing it. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I started doing these a little over a year ago and I mean, I did the big target window install, which is completely that based thing was on the electric fucking posters. Awesome, by the way. But yeah, that's all the stuff I learned doing these. It's all built in with lights and, and, and spinning donuts built on uh, little motors and, and all this stuff. So pause for a second. Uh, you did the full windows for a target store. Yeah. During holiday. Yeah. What a dream. Yeah, great, great project. Paid really well, I'm assuming. Yes. Okay. How did doing a self-initiated electric poster play into that gig? Well, so I was I was tapped to do... Well, no, I wasn't. I was tapped, actually, to do the, um, the downtown Portland... Every year they do a downtown Portland campaign. You know, mm -hmm. Come to Portland and shop. Don't go to the mall. Don't shop online. Come downtown. We have lights and trees and hot cocoa. And, and so I've done this for two years now. Um, so I went in and I, I pitched that and won that account again. Uh, but what I also did was I said, you know, I would like to take this stuff we're doing and I would like to make this dimensional. I would like to take these little buildings and cars and reindeers and stuff. And I want to make basically it's a small world, but for Portland. Mm. Uh, and so then we approached me in Portland, approached Target and said, we we see that you have it's 120 feet of, of window space facing downtown with pretty much nothing in it. They don't really do much with their windows. Yeah. You know, and so well, they they're on like, a tight budget. And so they, yeah, they said, that sounds great. Um, and then my wife was actually, she was like, well, you got to build some of that electronic shit into this. You know, don't just put up a bunch of like, you know, it's, it needs to spin and it needs to do all this stuff. And so like a Christmas window, the like kids walk window. up to. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's exactly what I wound up building. But I mean, I went to them and they said, that sounds like a great idea. Uh, and they, they signed off on the budget and they bought me like thousands of dollars worth of like little gizmos and motors and lights. And it's and almost as if, if there were like, just imagine when you're making this stuff, if there was a store that you could go to that only sold little wires and batteries and bolts and nut, like you could call it something like Radio Shack <laughs> and you could just go there and buy all these little pieces and build stuff. Wouldn't that be such a rad store? The funny thing is we have that store in town. Oh, really? Uh, it's not called Radio Shack. It's called United Radio Supply. It's been there forever. It's in a it's in a shitty part of town that is no longer shitty and I'm worried they're going to get pushed out by a Starbucks. Oh, no. Um, but it's a great store. You walk in there and the same lady's been smoking a cigarette standing behind the counter for 70 years you know what size I, battery pack. right and she, she you know <laughs> but the other day i went in there and i bought something from a uh, there's a young woman working at the counter i've never seen her before uh and and she ran my credit card she goes are you dan styles and i said yes and i thought maybe she was questioning whether it was my credit card that's your you, id are you the guy who builds those those electric posters and i'm like Whoa. holy shit 
like somebody's actually seen one of these, you know? Wow. Um, so she, she knew my work. So, okay. But again, this is all self-initiated. Nobody asked me to build the first 10 of these things. It was me exactly. just being like, oh, I don't know, this, this sounds fun. I mean, hey, the president of Showbiz didn't call me up and say, uh, we need you to do this podcast. Right. It, it, it all begins with love. But I love connecting the dots. So the city of Portland, the downtown Portland shopping district, mm -hmm. and you, you go to Target. Target's like awesome. Right. But give me the direct connection to the electric poster. Was it? Somebody had seen it and requested it, or were you able to say, "So my idea is to do this, and because I have a working prototype, they could that's what it was it. the okay, second thing. We, we pitched it because we had I had already had enough experience building this on a small scale. I mean, I'd never mm -hmm. done 120 feet of this before because mm -hmm. everything I've done is 18. I am so bummed that I didn't make it up here to see that. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was kind of weird to step back and look and be like, "Holy crap, it works!" That's because, a dream gig. Because of mine. all of this, most of this stuff, I do. I know some portion of it, but I always throw in something I've never worked with before, like a new type of light or a new type of computer controller or something. So there's always a, they're they're all a huge gamble, you know. Like until I got the one sitting on the table over there working yesterday, I didn't know if it was going to work. But it was like, well, I have some amount of faith that I can pull this off. Right. And, and so you're always, I think it's that, that getting outside your comfort zone yeah. and scaring yourself a little is kind of how you make progress. Because mm -hmm. um, if you don't do that, you kind of stay in the same place. And if with what we do for a living, if you stay in the same place, um, I always use the, uh, the rope bridge analogy from like Indiana Jones. Yeah. You're running across that bridge, right? <laughs> yeah. And there's alligators below you and there's the guys with spears in front of you and the Nazis are in front. But, you know, if you don't keep running, the planks are breaking underneath your feet, you know? And right. so you've got to keep going towards the Nazis or the guys with the spears or whatever, because otherwise you're going to follow the alligators. So, I mean, it's a stupid analogy, but it, it is kind of how this, this the analogy works. I always use in life. I mean, I love that you've got Nazis and alligators <laughs> and fire and, and explosions. My analogy is so much more bullshit and working class. I always use the analogy of passing a semi truck in the rain where it gets the worse before it gets better. Right, because you, when you're behind that that back tire, it's giving you so much more rain. <laughs> but you gotta just get past the truck, and then it opens up. But a lot of people, they're like, "Fuck this truck!" They get right next to that tire. Life gets really, really hard, and then they go, "This is scary," and then they just back off and then go back behind the truck. You know, and like, I love it. I'm just <laughs> trying to get around a, a, a big rig, and you're trying to fight Nazis and get away from explosions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, who's the better storyteller here today, Dan? That would be you. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, the good old Indiana Jones rope bridge trope. <laughs> so I love that idea, though, that because you'd fucked around on your own time, ha came up with a vision of this, created a new skill set, you're able to tackle something huge, which is a holiday display for the, the second biggest retailer in America in a A-level market during the holidays, like the, the, the pressure points here are stacked on top of each other. And that wouldn't be the time that you would want to try to pick up the hobby of solder. Right, exactly. You know, you don't you don't learn it on that kind of job. You learn no. it on the small stuff. But I mean, that's I don't know where you got into screen printing, but I started screen printing. I was making posters, just black and white Xerox ones, and I realized I needed to up my game. So I taught myself to screen print and I started screen printing versions of the black and white posters that nobody asked for. Mm -hmm. They didn't pay me. Mm -hmm. they, they paid me $20 to do an 1117, mm -hmm. you know, for pavement or whatever. And I would show up with those and then 20 screen printed ones. And I'd be like, here, these are something I've been working on in the basement and they're a little funky, yep. but I'm also not charging you for them. Uh, and eventually I, I honed that skill into something that was saleable. But the yep. first dozen I did were sort of crappy, but that didn't matter because, you know, it wasn't. You know, I'd, I'd already done the part of the job I was getting paid for. This was just bonus, like gravy. You know, when we, when you and I first got into posters around the exact same time, you know, migrating over to silk screen posters, I think about it all the time. My initial thought was, I need to hire a poster guy that prints my posters for me. And the fact that I couldn't find a screen printer, it it changed my entire life for the better. Like it, for, I've always had this mindset of. I'm not good with my hands. I'm not good with my hands. And it was the first time in my life that I really pushed myself to learn a craft, you know, to, to learn a trade, if you will, uh, to work outside of just at a keyboard. And I think about it all the time, man. Like if I would have just found somebody who's like, yeah, I'll print your stuff. I probably wouldn't have made as much stuff because I would always be like, oh, every time I get a poster done. It's a lot of money. Printing's not cheap. It's 300 bucks. But to me, it was always just like, I've got more time than I have money. So if I'm down in that basement for two and a half days, so be it. 
because at the end of the day, uh, a thing of speedball was $28. And you learn so much. You learn like, oh, man, my traps are shitty. Or mm -hmm. like, oh, when I lay blue on top of red, mm -hmm. I got a third color. Or, you know, I should really change. Or, or when I accidentally overprint these two things, this is a really cool design thing that I accidentally did. I'm going to work that into the next poster. But outside it's of that, you learn manufacturing. And you learn the idea of, well, those screens are coded and I'm waiting for them to dry. We can get all of our inks mixed. We can get all of our paper separated. You know, like while those screens are burning, I can eat a quick sandwich while I rinse them out. You know, like you just, I'll pack the orders. Like you just would look at a day of all these events and you'd put them in a way where you could always be doing as many things at once as possible. You know, because the thing that I'm always fascinated that when you get an intern is that you're like, okay, well, those screens need to dry for like 20 minutes. And then you just pull out the just phone. stand there. <laughs> I'm going to be on my phone for 20 minutes. That's what, how long it takes, right? It's like, oh, uh, what are you doing, dude? We're always moving. We're always moving here. Yeah, I learned that working in kitchens. Oh, yeah. Time yeah, to lean, time to clean. Yeah, it's like everything in a kitchen is just, you know, you're running from one to the next. You said that in your uh, adventure this year to focus on better versus more, that you adopted the idea of a day planner. Yes, I've never had one. This is what I've learned about my life. If probably the greatest apps ever made by Apple are the one that's called Notes and the one that's called Calendar. I, Cal, if you want to get fancy. But what, if I look at my calendar and I start putting in blocks of time, it takes out the illusion in my mind of how much I'm actually going to get done today. Yes, if absolutely. I, if I think, okay, well, I got to edit this show. That's three hours. Um, I need to do this. That's a half hour. Then all of a sudden you're at like seven o'clock real quick. And I've also learned that if I work within those blocks of hours, I don't dilly dally. And I put as much into the cover as it needs to be. I make a deal with myself. Tomorrow's cover only needs to be 30 minutes. Because it's a one shot on Instagram just to tell people that I'm still alive. If I get focused on the minutia and the details of a disposable piece of artwork, I'm fucking myself. Well, I mean, if you tell yourself you got to be done with this task by two, you hustle up until two, maybe mm -hmm. run till 2.10 if you mm -hmm. really got to do something extra, and then you, you walk from it. It's, it's like, it's sort of like I learned this with going to the gym. You got to schedule that 11 o'clock on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you go to the gym and it's like a dentist appointment. I mean, you don't just decide not to go to the dentist, right? Once you've yep. had that appointment, you've had that appointment for two months, yep. you show up at 11. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. Yep. You need to treat anything you really want to get done that way. So if at two o'clock, I have to stop working on the design I'm working on and switch over to working on this book cover or whatever the next thing is, I do that now. I yep. don't just keep going and push the other thing off the bottom because it blows the whole schedule out. Uh, and it's amazing <laughs> because you think, all right, that would that would mean I dropped this one thing and that's not getting done, but it, it all works out in the end. Yeah. It, it really, if you have everything locked down and you have a little, little, little wiggle room, you can't you know lock everything so tight that it, you're going to screw yourself, but... Are you ready for this? All right. Jay Shin or Jay Sean, Jay Shaw, get your, this is one to go out on the fucking notes. This is going to get me kicked out of design. When you put together your calendar, I always leave space between things. Mm -hmm. It's like when you're watching porn and it's a MMF three-way, two guys and a girl, always leave space. You never do your calendar nuts to butts. <laughs> Because bad things are going to happen. All right, I'm leaving that one alone. So you always put space between you and the other dude. And that's how you run your calendar. All right? Hopefully that one makes the list. Sadly, I actually call those catch spaces. I call it, <laughs> that's, That is literally what they are called on my calendar. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there's one that gets me kicked out of the design community I'm again. I'm catching for Mark. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck man but yeah i, I really believe that <laughs> putting those those <laughs> those gaps in there are so important because i've tried to tell this to people before and they get really <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying so hard to like keep it going but i want to pause and laugh um I've tried because everything I'm saying, I can see the next metaphor to go back <laughs> down the porn ro road. What you want to do, though, is you got to keep those open gaps. <laughs> you need to keep a couple gaping holes in your schedule. <laughs> 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 because 
when you try to run like this is going to go on time <laughs> this is going to go here it you're setting yourself up for a defeat and then what's going to happen is you're going to you're going to hate this method you're going to hate the calendar and you're going to feel like a failure but if you give yourself a little bit of extra time on everything and you leave the gaps and you can start to run a little bit ahead in life then you yeah. get a vibe of like success because some stuff good. doesn't take as long as you think some stuff no. takes a little longer i mean you you always you know you gotta you can't schedule it down to the minute no it's just not gonna work no it's not realistic because yeah. life happens yeah all right we were talking about a couple of things last night that i'm pumped on and one of them was that i'm coming back here in july is when we're yep. doing this yeah okay so I'm writing Dan Styles a check today for $250, which is my 50% <laughs> deposit in a vehicle that Dan Styles and I are buying for $500. <laughs> so we're going to we're buying a $500 car off of Craigslist. Yep. And you and I are going to do what with a $500 we're car? We're going to race it across the desert. <laughs> So there's a there's a thing here every year. It started in Oregon. It's actually a national thing now, but it's it's kind of flat stock on wheels. But it's it's uh, it, it's a bunch of guys that started out with this. These dudes are like, let's get a shitty car on Craigslist and basically see how far we can drive it till the wheels come off. Yeah. Uh, so it's become it's now become a race called the Gambler 500. Oh, I love and that. You, and you buy a $500 car off Craigslist and you drive it 500 miles, 250 miles out into the desert and then 250 miles back. That's great. And now there's, there's hundreds of cars. So it's like the Mad Max chase scene. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like, like all, but there it's, it's like the, the, the point of it is to drive the most inappropriate vehicle yeah. you can get. So there are mobs of Toyota Corollas and like minivans and you know, like nobody's driving a proper four wheel drive vehicle. Right. Um, Cause some of it's off road. Yeah, like half the race is off road, <laughs> and, and and I mean when I say off road, I mean like Jeep trails. <laughs> I can't wait to see us in a Datsun two ten that, that has a four speed. You know, you say Mad Max, I'm imagining wacky racers. Yeah, that's, that's what, what I'm, I'm seeing. seeing. <laughs> <laughs> if if possible, to put a little bit of Portland and art installment into our vehicle, I'd love to get those those trays that they mount on the side of your vehicle when you go to like an A and W root beer stand. <laughs> If we could just have full trays of food, like rubber cemented on the side of <laughs> our totally car. That is totally doable. <laughs> It'd be so good. So what are we going to do? Are we going to, um, do I need to hit up Jack Prince and get some like vinyl graphics for sure. this thing? And, I mean, and It's whatever the hell you want to do, man. I mean, there's, there's no rules, literally no rules. But we need to do something to this vehicle because yeah, obviously we, we got to turn this into content. Yes. <laughs> That's we the can, reason we why we're doing this. We can content the hell out of this. <laughs> this Dude, is content gold. There's part of me that I can't. I can't figure out what I'll be more stoked on. More stoked on hitchhiking back back, <laughs> or pulling up in your driveway and be like, we fucking did it. We did all 500 miles in our Toyota Corolla. Yeah, that, um, you know, I, I actually, because every year after this race, all the cars wind up on Craigslist again. Yeah. So you can buy people's old gambler cars. <laughs> um, and one of them was great. It was, it was a Toyota, no, it was a Subaru, which at least has four wheel drive, mm. but they had mounted a turbo to the roof. So there was a, it was a turbo. They, they had like, I mean, it, some Subarus already come with a turbo, but some, somehow they managed to put the fucking thing on the roof, wow. had all the piping running down like next to the wow. windows. Um, and then it said in the notes, they're like, you know, this is our gambler car. And we were really bummed. It worked too well. Like they built this piece of shit, crazy <laughs> fucking thing. And it actually got them there and back. And they were really bummed that they didn't, you know, wind up stuck by the side of the road. So they were going to get a shittier car. We should try year. to make a um, politically correct General Lee. We, oh, what would be on the roof? I don't know. We'd have to like we'd have to paint a rebel flag, but then take it down. <laughs> <laughs> Cover it with a tarp. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how we could do that, but there's got to be a way to do it. See, this is the type of thing that that makes me stronger. Like this wild ass idea of not a lot of money, but a lot of like vision of let's get a lot of people together. Let's all focus on doing something ridiculous and the camaraderie of doing it together will be what sells that it and makes it gold. fun. Yeah. Like this is to me everything that being a straight edge kid was always about because I wasn't wasting time getting wasted. I my whole life has been a series of gambler 500s. <laughs> and the thing that that I love about this is normally I have to wait till everybody else gets wasted 
to catch up with my stupidity, such as a hotel room full of people trying to get a hooker to show up so that we can gamble on how many times, well, not a hooker, an escort, um, how many times we'll be able to get her to dance the Ghostbusters in a row until she goes, fuck you guys, I'm leaving. <laughs> And this is an actual Real thing. story. Real <laughs> story. And before you're like, that's fucked up, man. I thought you were faithful to your wife. My wife was the one who was calling the escorts. I so. have a photo. I have photo evidence. <laughs> With the lollipop With in the her lollipop mouth. in her mouth. She worked that phone diligently all night. Nobody would come. Whatever task you give Beth, she's going to do it the best <laughs> of anybody. <coughs> so I love the idea of the Gambler 500. That's in July? Yes. I'm so down for that. I'll be giving you my check today. I cannot wait to see the vehicles that are just going to flood into my see, inbox. See, we talked about this last night, too. I, I have this thing, which apparently is not normal, where I give myself a budget, mm -hmm. and I go on Craigslist, and I shop for cars. that mm. I know, I'm never going to buy any of these, mm. but I, I just figure... I. Something pops into my head, some kind of, it's always a limitation, like, mm -hmm. oh, I, it has to be lifted, or it has to be manual, or what kind of Corvette can mm -hmm. I get for 1500 bucks? Or, you know, so... But you love the constraint of the yeah, budget. It, you have to have the budget. It's, yeah. Otherwise, it's just, you know, I mean, everybody wants a Porsche, but what kind of Porsche can you get for $500? You See, know, that makes it way more interesting. The thing that people miss in life is that life is fun with constraints. And that's why we're all commercial artists. It's the best thing about design. Exactly. Because commercial design or commercial art has an element of constraint and restraint to it. And that's what makes life fun. If you ever end up in a moment where there's suddenly the world's your oyster and everything's yours, you will find yourself the most depressed you'll ever have been well, in your I life. I mean, if you have a design project where they just give you complete carte blanche, unless you give yourself restraints, yep. you're going to auger in. Yep. I mean, if you walk into a, like a, a classroom of like 101 level designers and say, all right, everybody, make a design. They're all going to lose their shit because yeah. they're, they're going to be like, well, what, 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 what am I making? Yeah. You know, well, you know, and then the best student will be like, okay, I'm going to make a logo and it needs to be one color and it needs to be for, you know, whatever, a coffee shop. Yeah. They will give themselves a brief because if you don't start with something in mind, you're just going to spin in circles and you're going to wind up with something with 75 colors on it that, you know, gradients all over the place. And it's just the restraints are what makes good design, good design. Do know? we have to get license plates for this car? Yeah, it needs to be theoretically they need to be licensed and insured. I'm fairly certain a lot of them are not. Yeah. Yeah. I I'm wondering if we could come up with a fun vanity plate for this vehicle. <laughs> I'm sure we could. <laughs> I have no doubt that you you given six letters <laughs> and using I always love the guy that figures out how to write Satan, you know, yes. on a license plate cuz he uses 10, you know, S810 and you know, I always love the people who are like, "Oh, They'll never figure out that I'm writing sexy if I use a three instead of an E. I think, though, that our love of restraint comes from being children of a very special time in the history of planet Earth. And that's called the 70s. Is this where we talk about 70s middle class? Well, it's where we... And way to just break apart that beautiful tra <laughs> transition I just did. But I think the golden thing about the 70s into like the mid 80s is this. We had, the earth had the most amount of technology that it would ever have. But at that moment, there'd be technology with the least amount of rules. And so from like the mid 80s on, obviously technology just keeps going and going and going. But the rules are going as fast as the technology. But there was a golden era, 75 to 85, where shit's getting new and nobody gives a fuck about making it safe. And it was just a wild time to be alive and a wild time to be an eight-year-old who your dad's like, put that gun down, you're going <laughs> to shoot somebody. And you could just run out in the yard. And it was just the way it was. And seatbelts were like... A thing that uh, squares you. So yeah, one there was always that one parent who made you put the seatbelt yeah. on. And you're like, your parents are lame. <laughs> but now kids have to sit backwards in a car seat till they're 16. Yep. It's like it's insane that we grew up in a time where there were seriously like rules just weren't a thing. Like I no. think about all the time, you know, uh, you're jumping motorcycles and shit like that in the backyard. You know, just oh, there was a moment my there was a moment in my neighborhood. My first taste of like division of class is everybody gets a bike that's like a rite of passage but then some kids started to get a haro 
or G A red line. A red line, a fox red line. Yeah. Or a sky PK Ripper. PK Ripper. Nobody you, actually had a PK Ripper. That was like Sasquatch. You heard about that shit. You, you just saw the ad in, yeah. in BMX Freestyle or, or whatever it was. But then there's like the advent of the $300 bike. My dad's like, fuck you, man. You're getting the $50 one with no vertical bar <laughs> or no horizontal bar on the handlebars, <laughs> you know, from, from Toys R Us. So that was the first taste of like class. But then there was another class up where all of a sudden some kids in the neighborhood started to get like a, a 250 motorbike. Mm -hmm. And then other kids got the Honda Spree. I bought my own damn Spree. Thank you very much. That is a divisional thing in my neighborhood. There were those of us that were pedaling and those of us that were like, eat, eat, as they well, you drove crank by. it twice, trying to make it something like gears. Yeah. <laughs> you, you open the throttle <laughs> twice in a row just to make it like... <laughs> Eat, eat. Oh, man. That, I, I so bad wanted to be in that scooter world because, you know, there'd be like a cool kid in your neighborhood. And because he had that red Honda Spree or the sick black one with the purple trim, you could actually get like a chick to ride on the back. Yeah, although they were real slow with a chick on the back. Right? <laughs> the top speed, okay, If you, I figured that if you loosened the muffler, yeah. you could actually get them up to about 35 because yeah. they had a little back pressure off the muffler. And it was louder, too, and louder is always better, right? But with a girl on the back, like you were maybe pushing like 22 miles an hour. The thing I always wanted, though, is if you got that, that spree and you got the girl in the back, she put her arms around your waist, yeah. and I was like, "Man, I'm just riding this bike like a shithead, <laughs> pedaling everywhere I'm fucking I had a paper going." Route. I bought my own goddamn Honda Spree, which got stolen. I had a black one. Oh it got wow! Got stolen, and then I bought a red one after that. You had two. I had two. Wow. What? What? Do you remember what you? Are we doing? Are we? Four hundred bucks. Can we do the Gambler Five Hundred on a Honda spree? spree? Oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god if we had two sprees and we we're just like the shittiest version of chips <laughs> oh, oh <man>. fuck <coughs> it would fulfill one of my life's fantasies to always have had a honda spree but that was such a like a division of class but when you look back at in the 70s weren't that far ago or wasn't that long ago but if you look back at our lifestyles compared to your kids we it, it was like a different world like well, last everybody was poor but i don't think anybody thought they were poor no, never, was, i never was middle class. never thought of myself as poor i always thought of myself as middle class i had you know we had heat i had shoes i had a winter coat yeah but i also didn't get an atari for christmas we never went anywhere in an airplane we ate out maybe Four times a year, and that would be like at like Wendy's, you know. Vacation was going to see family. Yeah, vacation. You got in a car and drove your ass someplace to see family. Yeah, um, you know, it was just. But we we ate all our meals at home. Like, what was the baller thing that you like? Our family had one baller thing. The old man was like, "We're fucking poor." I I believe my dad told me at one point in the eighties that he was raising a family of four. My my stepmom was a stay at home. Um, and I think my dad was making it happen on like eighteen or twenty two thousand dollars. I never actually have managed to ask my dad. I, I'm embarrassed to ask because we all made it through just fine. So I'm not going to be like, "Hey, how much money did you happen to have when we were a kid?" Maybe I'll ask him. Which was wild because later in life, my dad would go on to do the same job, but to do it for FedEx and pull down serious money. And I told him one day, I'm like, "I bet you wish you had this <laughs> when you had three people at home that you were trying to take care of." And I think that was when he was just like, yeah, man. He's like, I don't know if you know this, but back in the day, I was pulling all of that down. I was a guy in my 20s making like $22,000 a year trying to make that shit happen. I was like, fuck. Yeah, I mean, we always, we never had a new car. Never had a new car. All oh, of our cars no. Were, my dad worked for a company where they would have a couple of people who had company cars to like go out on sales calls mm. and, and whatnot. And when those cars got too old for them to bother owning them anymore, my dad would buy them and limp them along for like three or four more years until they literally just you know, like shit the bed at the side of the road. My dad and I would go to a car auction. We'd go to the, it was like the Clark's, Clark County, Clark County auto auction or some shit. And we'd go there and, you know, some cars could drive through and some cars she people would push, would push through. Yeah. And me and my dad always loved it. My dad would buy me like a popcorn and we'd watch people auction off cars the whole time. And uh, there'd always be some fucking like redneck in the back, like trying to get the wheels moving. And you just hear some guy always go, sell that old truck, <laughs> <laughs> sell that old car, and, which is wildly connected to the 500 Gambler. But 
It was like an entertaining thing we went and did. We never bought a car at the auction, but buying a car for a dad in the the 70s, early 80s, it was like this epic year-long hunt oh, yeah. of trying to find this. Like My dad was always trying to find like that sweet deal. You know, and and I mean, I could literally do a Christmas story episode about my dad hunting for. And there he was. No car was good enough for this man. No, the white walls weren't white enough. You know, like my dad ended up. I remember my dad was raised in the ghetto, and so he has a very he had a very different idea of what high class was. And I remember my dad bought his first ever gently used Lincoln Continental. Ooh, see, the minute you get into Lincoln. You know, I mean, there's one across the street right there. Yeah. You know, look at that beaut. And my dad got a Lincoln Continental, gently used. It was as big as a barge, and the pride this man had. Because he, he came from the ghetto, and, you know, the yeah. Cadillac and the Continental was what all the older kids drove. It was like the coolest car in the ghetto. And my dad got one Lincoln, and then he got a second one. And then I think he's like, what am I fucking <laughs> doing? And then he finally, like, bought a pickup truck. But it, it was just... It was a weird way of living, and, and the thing that got us talking about this last night is uh, we were talking about all the great food in Portland, and you guys mentioned some like pretty bougie restaurant. You're like, oh, that's my daughter's favorite place to eat, and that made me think of go, wait a minute, us four adults at the table here. How often did we go out to eat as kids? Literally never. <laughs> like, we, we would go, once in a while, my mom would like not want to cook. My dad would be out of town. We'd go to Wendy's for a cheeseburger, and she'd get a cheeseburger and a coffee, and then I'd go nuts. I'd get like a triple whatever, yeah. because I, this was my one shot for like maybe two months to do this. But uh, every year, either for Christmas or for Thanksgiving, never both, um, we would go to Hobbs Steakhouse. And that was our once yearly mm. going out to eat. Mm. And Hobbs was like, I don't know, like Ponderosa Steakhouse. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not it's not good eating, but that was our one special thing uh, once a year. That was it. We went out to eat a, a bit more than that. <clears throat> but it wasn't like, so a lot of times when a weekend came, would come up on a Friday, because, you know, my, my stepmom, not my favorite person in the world, but I do have to give credit where credit is due. That woman put together a piping hot meal at 5.30 every night of the week. I mean, she stayed at home. The house was immaculate. Not one thing was out of place. You couldn't find dust on anything. And that food was hot and ready to go right at the time of dinner time. 5.30, set in stone. And on Sunday, she put together a big spread. But my dad would love to throw her a bone. And we'd maybe order in a pizza on Friday night or Saturday night. And some weekends we'd go out to eat, but the places we'd go out to eat, now that I look back on it, hilarious. Like if my dad would bring home Moby Dick, which is this fish place, you know, they had a sandwich called Whale of a Sandwich. And so they'd give you two little pieces of rye bread and like three giant pieces of fish they dropped in their fryer. Well, my dad get one whale of a sandwich <laughs> <laughs> and like two onion rings and we'd come home and we'd cut our cut fish out. <laughs> Man. <laughs> and add our own white bread. And like, oh, wow. I literally remember uh, like a Whopper getting ordered. Because, you know, if you bought those candy bars from kids in the neighborhood, buy mm -hmm. one Whopper, get one free. Mm -hmm. So we'd go get our BOGO Whoppers. And that Whopper would come home like, I'm going to fuck you up, Whopper. And then I would be like, no, no, no. The steak knife would come out of the drawer. <laughs> that fucking Whopper get chopped in half. I'm like, I'm only getting half of a Whopper? Like, Dan, I never had my own Big Mac. Until I was holding money at like 16 and bought my own Big Mac. So here's the question, though. Is that where your work ethic comes from? Because I spent... I, it's I where, never, my, it's I where never, my hating of sharing food comes from. I'll tell you I've that seen, right I've seen now. this in action. That's a real thing. Um, <laughs> How bummed was that last night when the waitress was like, you guys could share the soup. Oh, and Beth was all over. She's like, we could share that soup. And you were like, no, I will not share that soup. Fuck that. Bring me two bowls of soup. So we ended up sharing the soup. <laughs> Did you notice where the soup stayed the whole time? In front of Beth? Exactly. I rest my case. No, no further, no further questions. You, but, you're you know, so growing up, I, I never had the shit I wanted. I had everything I needed, everything I needed. You know, Absolutely. But I never had a single goddamn fucking thing I wanted. No. And so starting at the age of like maybe 12, I started a business mowing lawns. I uh -huh. made my own little flyers, took them around the neighborhood, put them in everybody's fucking yep. mailbox. And I got a couple clients. I'd mow their lawns for five, 10 bucks. And then I got a paper route at 13, started washing dishes at 14. And I've, you know, I've been working ever since Me too. because I wanted some fucking shit, you know? What and was the first thing you bought with your first paycheck? Because I know 
Mm, first paycheck, first real paycheck. I don't even fucking remember. I, but I would. I mean, I would take my money and I would. I wouldn't go and like play video games. My friends would get money never from parents because that's twenty five cents. Fuck that. It would last like eight seconds if you sucked at the game. Uh, I bought. I bought a lot of comic books. Mm. Um, I went to go see. Remember Houdini, the band Houdini. Yeah, I got a Houdini T shirt. Nice. I should have gotten the Run DMC T shirt. Looking back, because that would have been way cooler. Way to have cooler. Nineteen eighty four. Three Run DMC the street cred would be so yeah. high if you had that way better t-shirt. than Houdini. But I was big into Houdini. At but let's point. be honest: when eBay came about, you would have sold that Run DMC T. As I would have sold the Houdini one too if I still had it. <laughs> the freaks come out at night, baby. When I got paid the first time, so a buddy of mine, his name is Corey Roder. He his parents owned like because um, I always hung out with kids who were out of my class because I figured that I wanted to worm my way into a better life. Mm-hmm. So Corey Roder's parents. They owned or managed like a, a bay club or a, a, a harbor yard, right? Yep. And there was a restaurant there called the Limestone Bay Yacht Club. And Corey was the dishwasher and then he got promoted up to a, a, like a cook. So Friday nights, I could get a ride with him to the Limestone Bay Yacht Club, was way out on River Road, and I could wash dishes and I'd get paid cash. And so I got my first $50. And I went to the mall with a girl. Dreams are all coming true. I'm holding 50, and I'm at the mall with a girl. And the first thing I bought was a leather chain wallet. Because I'm like, now I got That's money. That's class. I bet she was really impressed. <laughs> now I got money, and I need a place to put it. So I bought a wallet. And you know what? That wallet still sits in the top drawer of my desk today. Like, wow. I still have the first thing I ever bought. And I'm always proud of myself that I'm like, I'm going to buy a wallet because I'm only going to make more money. More money coming. <laughs> Need a bigger wallet. <laughs> but I remember, Dan, because I always wanted things. Yeah. I, I I always had what I needed, but I never had what I wanted. And I would get paid, and I would blow it as fast as I made it. Because I'm like, I never had brand name skateboard t-shirts. I never could go to the record store. Like, I would go to the record store with my friends and be like, I kind of hope he buys that Dinosaur <laughs> Jr. record. Because I want to hear it. Right. I want to tape it. Yeah, my friend Derek Metton always had fucking money. Like, he is mo- like. He did less chores than me, but got this thing called an allowance. Mm. And, and like the rich kid allowance too, like 20 bucks. Yeah. Right? Not like a yeah. dollar. I got a dollar. I got nothing. I, <laughs> and what I got was this is, Marky, I need you to mow the yard. And today we're doing 45 degrees. Got it, dad. Like, because mm, every time pat, we- You did the, the, the 45 diagonals? Mm-hmm. Sharp. Because we do diagonals one time. Side to side the next, vertical the next time. So we wouldn't be putting any route in our yard. Wow. So not only would I get the the rule of- 70s dad action right there. <laughs> <laughs> not only would I get the rule like, hey, fucker, you're not skating after school. You're mowing the yard. And here's the, the mowing flight pattern that Everybody we're going on today. Everybody in this neighborhood pays- a bunch of dudes to come mow their lawn. Yeah. You don't, I mean, I, my neighbor who's 70 years old mows his own damn lawn. Um, He's my old lawn school. barely fucking grow, so I don't really have to, I mow it like, you know, four times a year with one of those little like push mowers, like yeah. not even the motorized kind, you know? Oh, you're old school. Yeah. Because yeah. um, it's the size of a postage stamp, but um, yeah, you drive through this neighborhood and the, the guy, like the six dudes will pile out of a truck, knock out the yard in 10 minutes and, and zoom away. And I don't ever, ever see a teenager mowing the lawn anywhere. Right no, now. there's two guys that come to my house <laughs> every week. Could be the same two dudes or could always be two different dudes. I'm not really sure. But the two dudes dr- show up and they rip they through our run. yard. run. They, they're literally running with the, with the weed whacker. The whole yard is mowed. All of the fruit that's fallen out of the trees is picked up. All the leaves are picked up. They cut out the sidewalk. They blow everything. They blow off our deck. They're out of there in 25 minutes. Beth and I have a nickname for them. Call them the Dream Team. But that's, I mean, that's an adult man's job now. Yeah. I used to be, I mean, and the, the dishwashing job. When was the last time I went to a restaurant and saw somebody that wasn't 40 years old washing dishes? But it was, it was, I think it was the best thing that ever happened to me to be 70s middle class. Because here's some of the most happiest days of my life. I did a music festival and I made a bunch of cash. And I knew that I couldn't be trusted with a bunch of cash. So I just went and bought a Nissan Pathfinder and I got to have a a new SUV and it was just like the day that I drove that car off the lot. I'm like, I never thought I'd have a new SUV. And another happy day of my life is I was doing okay, making money in freelance and a big check came in and I paid all my bills and I go extra money. What's that called? (laughs) And I went to a bike shop and on a spur of the moment, I bought myself a Haro. 
<laughs> you bought a Haro. Fuck yeah, I did. <laughs> Fuck yeah, I did. Did you get an Atari while you were in there? <laughs> and, you know, there are just these moments in life where I've just bought things that are 100% because that 15-year-old kid and that shitty neighborhood called Riverside saw everybody else get it. And I'm like, man, I wish I... I wish I had it. Yeah, I'm the same goddamn way. Yeah, but I, you know, I think that that drives all of this. Like, but you know. those are the precious moments, you know. And I think a lot of my design and interest with the podcast, and you know, last night I was trying, as I get put in the spot a lot, I was trying to make your wife not think less of me because I love <laughs> Disneyland so much. <laughs> And I think one of the things that broke down, I'm like, look, in my neighborhood, if you're one of the families that carted everybody up and went to Disney World, you were the shit. Mm -hmm. It's true. We never went. And the fact that any given day, I can just go to Disneyland and give myself that experience. I never take that for granted. And I always, when I'm there, I'm on my best behavior because I try to remember that these kids that are around me, some of these kids... This is the day that they will remember for the rest of their lives because mom and dad packed them up and took them to Disneyland. And I try to ignore the kids that can tell our AP holders that their family goes there every fucking Friday night like jerk offs. But I just think that there was the important thing is, is that like I never needed for nothing, you know, like uh, food was always there. My, the rent was always paid. Like it was never like if you see, you know, we owned our house. You know, if if you see the guy with the curly mustache come by, exactly. Don't answer the door. Don't answer the door. Like you know, we always had our books. Um, we ate government lunch at school. I got that card. You oh, know, I didn't have that, <coughs> but I had home food every day. Yeah, and my mom packed my lunch. We well, we. I mean, did you ever take your own popcorn into the movie? Um, we didn't go to many movies, but when we did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Goddamn popcorn. Is oh, my mom's are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> the brickies snuck food into anything you could. Like, I remember going to the mall once and be like, "All right, back out to the car to have lunch." Oh, wow. Like, fuck that food court. My old man wasn't gonna drop money at that food court. But yeah, I, I we've we pretty much like we would go to to Dubois County, uh, where my stepmom was from, Jasper, Indiana. And, you know, as a kid, it seemed like the longest drive ever. But I think realistically, it's probably like an hour and a half drive. Never once did we stop and get gas. Tank was always full. Never once did we pull off at like a roadside and like, hey, let's have like, it was like halfway in like an airline, like the pretzels would get yep, passed around. Bags of sandwiches. Yeah. Yep. And then, you know, my stepmom would pull out a soda and I'm like, oh, I'm going to fuck <laughs> that Coke up. She'd pop it. And then the two plastic cups. I'm like, God, I can't even get my own soda. Like I had to, everything was fucking shared. Mm -hmm. And when I became an adult, I'm like, I can have my own pop. You know what? You know what? Really, the the big change for me was not so much that first job as a teenager, but when I when I because I was I went to U of O, got the sociology degree, didn't. Then after that, decided to become a graphic designer. Tried to make it work myself, right? Yeah. Homespun graphic designer. I was poor as shit. For yeah. several years. Yeah. And then I decided to go back to school down in San Francisco, where I continued to be poor as shit for several years while I was in school. But I got hired out of the classroom by one of my professors. And when he made that job offer, I knew that at the age of 28, I was already probably making three times as much money as my dad mm, ever made. Yeah. And I never asked him how much he made, but I have a fair idea. Yeah. And I went out and I bought a pair of Kenneth Cole fucking shoes. Nice. Because I just... I don't even know why, really, but I was yeah. like, I'm going to buy some stupid fucking shit. And I went and bought a pair of like $300 men's wear shoes just because for the first time in my life, I like, I had fucking money. Like, yeah. We went out to dinner. I went from never ha going out to dinner to going out to dinner every night. Like me and Mel, when we, when we first met and started going out, we would, I mean, actually, I didn't look at our tab last night either. What did we pay for dinner last night? That's a lot of money, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, <laughs> you're at this point in your life, you're like, split it, split it. Brrr. And yeah, you're just I, I literally don't even remember, and it doesn't matter. But but we would do all that I know is we didn't get Delmonico's. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't have to pay for a hammer mill, so I'm like, oh, it, it, unless I'm out to eat with hammer, I'm like, it's less than three hundred. Right. That's an amazing deal. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but we would just for the first time ever, I actually could eat out. I could yeah. buy new clothes. I could I could get whatever it was I needed, whatever it was I wanted, and it didn't affect the bottom line. But I loved. When I first started working, you know, still in high school and I started to dress myself, you know, like I can buy a pair of Vans. I can buy Levi's and not, you know, like Lee's or right. whatever the Kmart brand Wranglers. is. Like Wranglers. Like 
it just felt so good to start to buy my own stuff. Um, and I just think that being raised any other way, you, you would just start life just assuming that all these things would happen. And I, I feel bad for uh, younger people today because you had the opportunity to go to San Francisco. How could anybody ever just go to San Francisco and figure it out now when a one bedroom apartment is $2,700? Yeah. Like, I don't, I, I mean, it's, I mean, you know, weird, weird saving for our kids' education and all that because we know, you know, we're, we're realistic about it. Mm -hmm. Like, not that mine was cheap, but it was a fuck of a lot cheaper than whatever theirs is going to be. Right. And at a certain point, you can't expect them to like waitress their way through college. You know, it's just, it's just not going to happen. And if they take loans, it's going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars. And you come into the job market like crippled with debt at the age of 24. Well, and the thing is, is the college used to be, College was a great investment because when you got out of college, you had a leg up on the competition. Now everybody has yep. a college degree, and uh, a lot of a lot of like business magazines, you'll see this article come out about every six months. Is college still a good investment? Um, and you know, I'm not advising this for your your daughters, but they say that like the best thing somebody could do nowadays is go to trade school. You know, like. If you, if you want to make like a solid income and have a pretty like cush life, go be a fucking electrician. Yeah, well, learn a skill. Yeah. I and mean, that's the thing now is like I had to go to college twice because the first time I got an education, the second time I got a skill. What was the, what did you get the first time? What was I that? I a paper? sociology degree, oh. which I mean, honestly, it actually, it's never like I walk up and sociologize on somebody, but because of what I do, that understanding yeah. of the way humans work and, yeah. and, and history and all that stuff, it comes into play every single day as an education but as a set of skills it's not a set of skills but you can always tell talking to you i mean you're a very bright guy and like i always love being out of my class my wife is way more attractive than i am i'm always around people that are more wealthier than me i talk to people that can speak better than me i speak to people that are smarter than me like i always love to be the dumbest ugliest guy in the room um and i love that your sociology it comes through in the way that you're able to not only do the work but dissect it and the market that you did it for and the trends that exist around it. Yeah, and that's that's what my takeaway from that, really, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to sum it up. Um, but it's still not a, it's not an applicable skill unless you combine it with something. So I had to go back to school to learn an actual trade. I mean, graphic design is pretty much a trade, right? Yeah. All right, let's do this. We've given everybody a, a, a plentiful shop talk. We, we went, we started this conversation talking about flat stock and electric posters. I made a horrible analogy that got me kicked out of the community. We've went over to old guy talk about how it was. We've we've dreamed better in the seventies. Better in the seventies when life was dangerous. I mean, basically, like this gambler five hundred is just me getting to live smoking the bandit and, and exactly. cannibal run at the it's same riding time. Riding your big wheel, with no helmet. Absolutely, it's everything. But think about it. You and I grew up in a time period where if you looked at all the hit shows. You could tell me what vehicle the lead guy drove. Oh, hell yeah. Magnum P.I. had his Ferrari. Yep. The A-Team. Starsky and Hutch, the A-Team. Yeah, had their van. Like, every, you know, Miami Vice was all about those. Oh, all about the cars. Ripping through the, yep. the, the Miami in those vehicles or in those cigarette boats out in the yeah. bay. Like, everything had a vehicle attached to it. That's why I always love uh, when they do those false castings on SNL. There's one of Norm MacDonald. As Burt Reynolds trying to get the role of Darth Vader. And he's like, he's not going to wear the helmet, so he's got it under his arm. And he's like chewing gum. And as Burt Reynolds, he goes, uh, what kind of car does this guy drive? <laughs> That's like the whole scene. <laughs> but we've, we've given you a solid shop talk. Now, if you want to join us for the next part of the conversation, you're welcome to stay. But if you don't like politics and this is a safe space, good day. We gave you a great show. Good day. See you. Bye. Be back tomorrow. Dan and I realized last night that we've each acquired a new ho hobby over the year of 2017, which is we have these rituals, right? You want to share your well, ritual it's, first? It's amazing to me that I brought this up or you brought this up and we both like kind of like locked eyes and we're like, oh my God, I do the same thing. The exact same thing. I had thing. no idea that anybody else, I mean, it makes sense that somebody else would be doing this too, but it's the exact thing. Like we wait, for me, it's nine o'clock at night mm -hmm. when the Rachel Maddow stream goes live mm -hmm. and I sit down at my computer and I don't work. I don't, I put on my headphones and mm -hmm. I give a hundred percent attention to Rachel breaking down the day's 
news, and it's always Trump news. Um, and she, she, I have, I have followed this thing like Game of Thrones. Yep. I know every character. Yep. I know every little side plot. And I got to tell you, man, he's a shit president, but the reality TV show president has brought us the greatest reality TV show ever because we are, in fact, living it. It's the Truman Show. And every night I can, I can watch Rachel break it down. And I, I, I'm just itching for the next episode. And if there's a slow news day, I get, I almost get upset. You know? I know. There's I get, nothing. There's nothing good today. There was a moment when I was like, you know, the news had kind of calmed down. And by the way, my setup is this: at the end of every day, I have it already loaded up on my iPad through my TiVo. I, I will lay in bed, or I'll be in the, my office, or or in the living room, and I put on my headphones and I put my iPad in front of me. Pro, big one. And I watch Brian Williams, The 11th Hour. And I have my TiVo set up that it records Brian Williams, The 11th Hour at at 8 o'clock on the West. And then it runs 30 minutes long. So I get all of Brian Williams. And then I get that opening monologue. The A Block. The it's A-block. called the A Block. The A Block. I know this now because I watch it so fucking often. Yeah. And, and, and so I watch the opening of Rachel. And this has been a tradition that hasn't broke protocol once. If I have a busy night. It will be how I start the next day. Yeah, and sometimes, the next day. Yep. sometimes if Friday night is wild, I go, you know what? I'm going to need this for Saturday night. <laughs> and what I'll do Saturday night is I'll watch the first part of Brian. And then Sunday night, I'll watch Rachel from Friday. Like this is a thing for me. And, and what I was going to say earlier is that on the slow news cycles, I'm like, kind of miss February 2017 when every day was just like <laughs> getting kicked in the dick. But this is what's happening. If you ignore the long-term effects that this is going to have on America. And if you ignore uh, some of the bad stuff that's happening, if you just consume the news as a TV show, this last year of news, the way that these MSNBC programs break it down to just the highlight reel, it is one of the greatest TV shows I've ever watched. It's better than Game of Thrones. It's better than The Sopranos. Dare I say, it's better than The Wire. Because... It's history happening in real time. And it's such a tangled mess. This Mueller investigation. You and I have been hearing about this now for for months, for over a year. It's finally starting to pay dividends. Mm -hmm. And oh, do I have a news boner for what's going (laughs) down. I mean, two weeks ago when they did the breaking news on the 13 Russian. Indicted the Russians, yep. That was like, fuck. Cannot wait till 11 o'clock tonight well, to watch Brian how's, Williams. How's Rachel going to break this down? Yeah. Like, what does this mean? Like, I, I see what this is now, but what does it mean? Yeah. And that's what she does for me is she's like, all right, so what we think mm-hmm. is that what they're trying to do, for instance, with those guys, it's like they're trying to first establish that this is, in fact, a criminal act. Yep. You know, and just stuff like that, you know, or whatever it is, it, it takes that extra that extra juice that they give it on MSNBC where they, they say, all right, you know, it's like it's like watching somebody break down a football play or something. Like yeah. That. What just happened here? Yeah. What are they getting set up for? You know, and it's it's I don't know, because they didn't have this full time 24 hour cable news cycle during Watergate. Mm-hmm. So you had to watch it on the six o'clock news or read about it in the paper. And it took years for Watergate to play out. Mm-hmm. We've been watching this for a little over a year now, and it's already indictments are going down. You know, I mean, the the White House is shedding, shedding top advisors. Well, in this past week that you and I just lived through in real time for this recording, we saw Hope Hicks have to to go in front of Mueller, in in front of the investigation, and, and do her day in the sun. So like nine hours of getting interrogated. She admitted to telling white lies for for the president. But then the next day, she hangs it up and resigns. Yep. That news cycle that night, there was Hope Hicks retiring or uh, stepping down. There was Kushner. Kushner. Yeah. Oh, what an MVP that guy is in our (laughs) plot line. I mean, he was found of doing business at the White House, taking loans of up to $500 million. Yeah, half a billion dollars with the loans. Half a billion with a B of loans for his family's, um, uh, you know, real estate business. Uh, there was Kelly taking away his, his cre- both him and Ivanka's press credential or, uh, or top secret uh, clearance. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's just, you know, Trump did all of this for the ego. And the funny, ironic thing that is happening is everything is 
pounding away at his ego. Like all of his trusted circle, like the people that surround him that make him feel stronger. Cause you know, he's a horrible guy, but he seems like a hell of a family man. You know, he really loves his family, but it's it, it slowly, everyone is getting turned against him or they're getting tarnished and they're getting plucked away. And it's like, if Mueller finds this much shadiness about Jared's financial doings, oh, the heyday when the Trump money mm -hmm. gets and broken you know down. They, I mean, it's that tip of the iceberg thing. I mean, because mm -hmm. he's not a leaky investigation. We don't really know what he knows. All right. we can do is like look at what he's done and try to postulate on what he might do next. What yeah. does this mean? Yeah. You know, but can you imagine? I mean, he's got access to the tax papers. He's got access to the banks. He's got access to all these witnesses that he's flipped. You know, he must he must know something. Um, and, and you can start to see slowly but surely it comes into focus. You know, the three different. Thank you for listening to Adventures in Design podcast. To hear part two of today's episode, visit adventuresin.design. Click where it says Circle of Trust and help support the only daily talk show designed for creative professionals just like you. Thank you for listening. Good day and good design.